This is the Welcome to the Sky podcast, your place for stories, news, opinions, and conversations about the best thing in the world, flying. I'm Lou Dix, your host and friend as we talk about everything from flight training to the airlines and much, much more. I have a lot to say, so sit back, relax, and let's get this thing off the ground in the Welcome to the Sky podcast. In this episode, I'm going to talk about how my flight training experiences shaped the pilot and the instructor that I am to this day. And we're going to finish off the podcast with a, a Q&A. I'd like to do Q&As in every Welcome to the Sky podcast episode. So if you're watching on YouTube, get into the comments and ask your questions. I'll pick the best ones and uh, talk about them on the uh, on the next episode. I'm back doing podcasting. I did podcasting before. I uh, did like five uh, episodes, I think it was, uh, but I stopped it because I, I wasn't enjoying the way it was going. I, you know, doing do, do a podcast, like I've recorded this now. This is the fourth time I'm recording this particular episode. Like, I, I just watch it back and I'm like, I'm so boring. Like, I find myself really, really boring. So good way to start a podcast, get people enticed by telling them that I'm boring. Woo! Yeah, let me legitimize myself a little bit. If you don't know who I am, my name is Lewis. I have a YouTube channel. If you're watching on YouTube, you already know that. If you're listening on Spotify and you never met me, hello. Welcome to the Welcome to the Sky podcast. I make uh, aviation videos on YouTube. I fly with my students. I fly with friends, family. And um, uh, hold on a second. Uh, one of the settings on this thing has me playing through the screen good that's gone all right good setup uh, yeah make aviation videos flying with students friends family anyone that wants to come and fly and have a camera shoved in the face they are welcome and uh, yeah I, I like to make aviation fun that's basically the premise of my channel I, I like to make sure i'm having fun while i fly and having fun with the people that i'm flying with because i think we spend a lot of money on flying and flight training and i think it has to be fun and I'm going to tell you some of my experiences today that haven't been so fun, but it's those and the other experiences that I've had in aviation have shaped me into the pilot and CFI that I am today. So let's get started with that conversation. So my flying experiences that I've had throughout my flying career, I started uh, actual flight training in 2008. And since that moment, I've had plenty of experiences. It, it all started with my discovery flight way back. And I think I think it was in 2006. I just, uh, just previously moved from England to the United States. And since being a kid, all I'd ever wanted to do was to be a pilot, go all the way up to the airlines and, and fly planes. Anytime I looked into the sky, that's the only place I wanted to be. So being a pilot was perfect for me, but I had to go and see how it was to actually fly a plane. And that's what a discovery flight serves. And I caught the bug big time and I'm still infected by that bug to this very day. It was an amazing experience. The discovery flight that I took was at a flight school at Kissimmee Airport in Florida and the instructor there greeted us and uh, told us that the discovery flight uh, had uh, a flight uh, portion and a simulator portion. So I was like, great, I'm going to get a lot of uh, a lot of learning in today, got a lot of flying, whether it's in the real world or on the simulator. So I was really excited. So we went for the flight. Flight was amazing. Like there's no experience like flying. The, the feeling of freedom and just getting away from everything on the ground was an amazing feeling to me. And it, it really, that that stuck with me. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so so we did, did the flight. It was amazing. We got back on the ground and it was time for the simulator. This is kind of where it started to go a little bit south. And obviously, I went on the flight and now we come back to uh, to the ground, to the simulator. And the instructor says, OK, hop into the simulator. He showed me how to control it and stuff. And he set up a lesson on the simulator and uh, walked away. Left me to it. And in my head at that point, I'm thinking, well, hold on. Are you not going to you're not going to sit down and, and train with me? You're just going to make me sit here and go through a, a lesson on the thing. I want human interaction. I need the human touch. Hold, well, hold on. But yeah, he, he left me and uh, I was left to my own devices trying to go through this lesson. And what lesson do you think that he put on for a brand new Discovery Flight student? VORs. So I'm sat in the simulator trying to figure out how to turn the OBS. I, I remember it vividly. On the screen, it was, it was telling me turn the OBS to such and such. And I, was, I just had no idea what I was doing. Imagine brand new student. Well, I mean, not even a student at this point, just dis discovery flight kid trying to figure out what a VOR is. Private pilot students don't know what a VOR is, let alone discovery flight people. The point that I'm trying to get to is the fact that this instructor on the discovery flight, as early as the discovery flight, 
left me to my own devices in a simulator. I felt like I was in daycare. He'd gone. I, I was on my own. The lobby of the flight school was empty, and that's where the simulator was. And I was just left to try and figure all this out on my own. And I, it, it, that really stuck with me. And that was the first experience that I had flying an aircraft and, and going into a lesson. So, I mean, the first impression is is the one that leaves the, the biggest mark and it, it left a big mark on me. But anyway, it took uh, from 2006 to 2008 for us to get money together for me to be able to go to flight school, at which point we toured a flight school in Kissimmee where we were living. And funnily enough, the, that flight school was in the same building that I'd had this previous experience. Only now the flight school there was called Orlando Flight Training. Went in there, had the big smoke and mirrors show where they tell you everything about the flight school, how great it is, you know, how their instructors are the best, how their aircraft are the best, and they would never have any maintenance issues until one of the instructors that I had there left the tow bar for the Piper Cherokee on the front of the plane, started the plane and smack. So that was a maintenance issue. We'll get to those instructors in a second. But yeah, smoke and mirror show, we bought into it. But my family scrounged $15,000 together and put it on the account at this flight school. Mistake. Big mistake. Very naive of us to do that. From 2008 to 2009 is, is the time that I was at this flight school. And during that time, it was actually less than a year that I was there. During that time, I had six different flight instructors for my private pilot certificate. Now... If you've been through flight training and you've had to switch instructors, you know what an absolute bitch it is to get comfortable with somebody and then have to switch flight instructors to somebody else who's completely different. You as the the, the pilot, the, the student pilot, you are feeling apprehensive when you go into flight training at first. You get comfortable with somebody and then you've got to change. You get apprehensive again. And like Every single time, six different times, after getting proficient with one instructor, going to another one and having to do more work because that instructor now has to see what I'm proficient at and what I'm not proficient at, what I need training on. So I'm spending extra money with the new instructors every single time to show my proficiency and stuff. And it just got to a point where I was doing that so much that I ran out of money. The flight school had f***ed me six different times and they didn't use aviation grade oil. So that, that was the experience at that flight school. Some of the instructors that I had I say some, probably two, really actually cared about the students, but the rest of them just did not. The first guy that I had was a really strict guy. Bearing in mind we're in Florida, right? The heat of Florida. We all have to wear uniforms because it's part 141 school. I was actually doing my stuff part 61, but I was getting treated as a 141 student. So I'm wearing stupid pilot uniform to fly Piper Cherokees, which I am completely against. Shouldn't be wearing a uniform until you're a professional pilot, in my opinion, unless it's like a polo. A polo is fine, but don't make students wear full on uniforms with the epaulets. Like, what's the thing when you're a private pilot? You don't have an epaulet on here. Then why are we wearing a uniform? What are we doing? The, uh, where was I? My anger sidetracked me. Yeah, I had a couple of a couple of flights. The, the first guy, the first guy is the heat in Florida. He would always come in in this leather bomber jacket with fluffy stuff around his collar. And yeah, he was a really kind of strict guy. No fun in the cockpit. Made me feel really kind of on edge every time that I flew with him. That really did stick with me how he was. I just didn't enjoy my time flying with him. Felt really apprehensive. Didn't feel comfortable. And uh, he left. And then I got another guy who I kind of got along with. Then I got another guy and another guy. And yeah, it just, just kept going on and on. And I eventually lost lost all the money. So in 2009, I stopped training until 2012. I stopped for three years because of this. Like, the, 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 there was one guy. There was one guy that was the one instructor that actually I really did get along with. I actually really liked him. He actually, we had a lot of fun together. But it just goes to show that how people can be that are looking out for themselves as instructors. He made us do a cross-country flight that we didn't need to do. And me being such a green student, not really knowing and being naive, you're naive. You're expecting the instructor that you're with to kind of guide you and, and, and not take advantage of you. But there's one day he took us on a cross-country. We went down from Kissimmee to Naples, and we got to Naples, we got out the plane. He says, okay, we're going to go and get dinner. Great, beautiful, best thing in the world. Go flying and get get some food. Still do that to this day. But when we arrived at the restaurant, I realized what this actually was. Because at the restaurant, there was a woman waiting for us. So we all sat down, me in my stupid pilot uniform, instructor in his pilot uniform, sat at a table with a woman across from us. And it was a date. <laughs> 
He'd used me as a student to fly us down, to use my money to fly us down to Naples to go on a date with somebody that he met. That's the sort of stuff that would happen. And I, I ran out of money, so I had to stop. So all that experience just left a really sour taste in my mouth about flight schools. And and that stuck with me from, from the very, very get-go. I left there without a private pilot certificate and uh, a, a sh load of hours. I think at that point I had like 80 something hours and nothing to really show for it. Only a few solos. But from one bad experience to a good experience, because in 2012, I decided to go back to flight training. I said, get off your ass, go and achieve your dream and become a pilot. So I did. So 2012 came around. I found a, another flight school in Orlando, uh, Orlando Executive this time at a flight school called Air Orlando. My flight instructor there, Josh, the best flight instructor that I've had on the general aviation side, hands down, treated me with respect, treated my money with respect, was very knowledgeable, made flying fun, made me want to be there with him uh, in the cockpit. And we just had a fantastic time. Within three months of going there, I had my PPL. He really showed me what it was to be a really good instructor. Going from losing the love for the training process from the first flight school to now finding someone that I get along with and, and really cares about me, because it's important. Like when you, as a flight instructor, you go through your fundamentals of instructing, you see the psychological side of, of being an instructor and getting inside a student's head. Josh did everything to the T. Really made me feel like he cared about uh, about me and wanted me to succeed. He, he was fantastic. On the day of the check ride, the private pilot check ride, he texted me on the way to the flight school and he asked me, have you eaten? I said, no. And when I was there, he was waiting for me with an egg McMuffin from McDonald's because he's just like, kid, just, just little stuff like that just shows how much care that somebody has for you to succeed. Like the, the successes that, that I had during that training with him were his successes as well. So yeah, best flight instructor that, that I've ever had on the general aviation side. And, and just like the bad experiences stuck with me from the first flight school, the good experiences with Josh stuck with me forever as well. So uh, it, it, was, it was really good. It's just cool to, to see how much of a, a difference a caring CFI can make in building the confidence in, in students. I was riding high. I got my uh, PPL with Josh, my instrument with Josh. And from those highs, I went to another crushing low. Found a flight school in Kissimmee because at this point, uh, Josh had, had left to go to the airline. So he, was, he wasn't available. So to do my commercial CFI and CFII, I found uh, a place in Kissimmee, Florida again. And funnily enough, the guy that owned it or owns it, still there, was one of the instructors that I had at Orlando Flight Training, the first flight school that fucked me without aviation oil. Should have been a warning sign. So at first, of course, the smoke and mirrors show again about how good he is and how good his flight school is and how he wants to bring humanity back to flight training. Bullshit. Like it all started well albeit with, with some eyebrow raising things. Like there was one time where we were doing commercial and CFI training, like kind of splitting it up. And he t we went flying to do some maneuvers and stuff. And we actually took the plane cross country to another airport. And once we arrived at that other airport, we landed, got out of it and hopped into his other aircraft, which was there in maintenance, got in that plane and brought it back to Kissimmee. At the time, I was too naive to realize what had actually just gone on but what had just happened was he had used my money to get me to pay for his aircraft and his time to go up to this airport pick up his other plane and transport it back and uh, it was just completely unnecessary so i mean as as eyebrow raising as it is now i didn't realize it at the time but that's the sort of thing that would happen and i'll tell you i've got other stuff i've got stories for days about this place well whatever I i'm not gonna get into it this isn't a bitch fest about it I'm i need to talk to you about my experiences so let's get back to that shall we when i became a cfi at this place i started to see from the inside just how bad things were I'd say about 90% of my students had problems with the owner. This is a part 61 flight school, right? Whenever I wanted to send a student solo, I had to send the student to the owner to fly with, the, with him so he could, you know, check them out and make sure they're okay for solo. Every single time, bar like one or two, maybe, he would send those students back to me saying that they need extra training, which was bullshit. That was the start of me thinking, okay, well, that, that, that seems really weird because the, the student's ready to go. Like I'd fly with them again and they'd, they'd be absolutely fine and, and ready to solo. And then 
all of a sudden after that flight or after those couple of flights, even without flying with them, he'd say, okay, yeah, they're good to go. So it's just a money-making scheme. You just want to make the students do extra work to pay extra money so you can have money in, in the flight school's pocket. Like it just seems so unethical. And I started to realize that this was happening. And there were more and more things that were going on at the flight school that again, I could go on for days about uh, stories about, about what I saw. But the point is when I first started flight training at the first flight school, I saw things from the student's perspective and it was bad. Now I'm at a flight school where I'm seeing things from the inside, from the instructor's perspective, and it's bad. So I've seen it from, from both sides, how students are getting taken advantage of. And I didn't want to be part of taking advantage of my own students. It was a real dilemma for myself. I was like, do I stay for my students and kind of know that this stuff is going on uh, uh, or do I leave and then leave my students, you know, with, without an instructor? And because again, it's a horrible time when a student has to change instructors. It's really tough. It got to the point where things were getting out of hand. My friend Otto, who you see on the on my YouTube channel, he had a disagreement with the owner as well. That got to the point where they cut ties with each other and Otto was no longer renting this guy's aircraft. So if I ever wanted to fly with my friend Otto, I would have to go up to Orlando Executive and rent a, a different aircraft and fly with him up there. Once the owner found out that I would fly with Otto every so often, I got told I was flying with the enemy. My brain was out of there. Like I, I, I was losing the love for instructing because I didn't want to go in and instruct at this place. It felt like it just didn't sit well. It did like something inside me was telling me you have to get away from this place, regardless of if you're going to hurt your students by by leaving. You have to leave. I wasn't providing the best instruction to my students from this point onwards because I didn't want to be there. And I noticed that as well. And I just thought it was best to get out of there and not deal with the, with that place anymore. So I did it. I left and it, it was the best thing that I did. I, I, I was really, really, uh, I felt so much freedom from, uh, from leaving there. And just to go back to that first flight school. So as a student, I stopped flying there because I ran out of money. They sucked the life out of flight training for me. Fast forward to this flight school stuff. I'm in there as a flight instructor. The life is being sucked out of flying for me again. And uh, it's just a, a, another experience that has left a huge mark on me as a, a pilot and, and as a flight instructor. So when I became an independent CFI in 2018, I started instructing up at Orlando Executive again, uh, or again, or flying up at Orlando Executive again. Whether I had a good experience or a bad experience, I took everything that I'd learned and everything that I'd been through, I put it all into the package that you see on my YouTube channel now. And I said to myself that I would never allow myself to suck the life out of flying for any of my students. The experiences that I went through of the flight school taking my money, the experiences that I went through of the flight school that I was working for, taking people's money, I said to myself that I would, would always respect a student's wallet. The experiences that I had with flight instructors that didn't make flying fun, that made me feel apprehensive. I said I would never allow that to happen. I have the freedom now as an independent CFI to do things the way that I want to do them, to make my own course of training for people. If I want to make fun part of that course, I can do it and I do do it because when I was in flight training, for the most part, until I got to Josh, I didn't have a good time. I didn't enjoy a lot of it. I enjoyed the solos because nobody was sat next to me. So now that's the bad stuff. The good stuff that I took is all from Josh. His lighthearted and fun approach w was fantastic, but it was always goal oriented. It was always standard oriented. So we're maintaining high standards, even though we're out there talking shit to each other and, and having fun about stuff. And it really stuck with me and, and had a massive mark on me that you can have fun while operating an aircraft safely. There is a way to fly and have fun and maintain standards. Don't let anybody suck the life out of flight training for you. If you're looking for a flight school or a CFI, test them out. You have the right as the student to be with somebody that cares about you, that respects your money, respects your time, and is looking out for your best interests. If the person that you fly with for a couple of times might take a few times of flying with them to find that out. If you fly with them and see that it's not working out, you have the right as the customer, as the student, as the person, 
to, to get with somebody else that does care about you, that does want you to succeed, that does celebrate your successes. Like every success that I have with students, I celebrate. Like if they once if we're working on landings, once they get that first greaser, I celebrate it like it's a goal in football. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh yes. Boosh. You need an instructor like that with you. So you have the power to change things if it's not going well, is what I'm getting at. And yeah, just make sure you're having fun. Because if you're not having fun when you fly, it's time to move on. And with that, we are going to move on. Those are my experiences in flight training and how they've shaped me. If you've had an experience in flight training that's shaped you, that has, has really stuck with you throughout your whole career up to this point, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear about it and maybe talk about it on another Welcome to the Sky podcast episode. With all that being said, we're going to move on to the Q&A section. Like I said, in the Welcome to the Sky podcast episodes, I like to do Q&As in all and if not all, most of them. Here we go. Fly Weld Fabricate. What's the scariest thing a student did during a lesson? Students are always trying to kill flight instructors. It's a death wish to become a flight instructor, but it's also one of the best things to do in aviation, in my opinion. Scariest thing, the most, most recent scariest thing was we were flying along into an airport uh, and uh, I asked the student to change the fuel tanks on the Piper Cherokee. And I looked out a window as I'm looking at the views, just enjoying my life, the engine starts to sputter. I immediately swing my head around, take the controls, and I'm starting to go through my emergency procedure. Best glide speed, best field to land, going through my checklist floor, mixture rich, fuel pump on, carburetor heat, swing my eyes over, I look at the fuel selector. The student had accidentally turned the fuel selector to the off position. So, like Clark Kent, went into the phone booth, put my cape on, put on my spandex, is it? What, is, what did he wear? He wears spandex, whatever. Smashed out of the phone booth, switched uh, one of the, uh, to, uh, the fuel sector to one of the fuel tanks, and the engine came back immediately. Thought it was going to be my first engine failure. It was a good debrief for, for them to learn not to do that, and for me to remind myself that, listen, you can't always trust every student you've always got to be watching them like a hawk mustafa what would you say is the hardest license or rating to get hands down cfi cfi is really tough not only because you have you, you've got a lot of work to do to get all your lesson plans together and go through two different written tests if you're in the united states but then you have to go through the check ride which is a really long check ride the oral's really long and then you have to go flying after it my oral was six and a half hours and the very last question, I don't actually believe I gave the wrong answer. I believe I didn't give a CFI standard answer. However, I don't believe I had the wrong answer, but whatever, that's, that's neither here nor there. The guy failed me. Now, the guy told me at the beginning of the day that he had to be leaving by 4 p.m. I looked up at the clock once he said that I'd failed. It was 3.55. So I'm not making excuses. So six and a half hours, my, my brain was fried. I, I was I was so, so done with it at that point. I'm, I'm actually, uh, I was not in any mental condition to go and fly. My brain was absolutely fried. Like people are better than me though. They do these long orals, pass them and then go flying for the CFI chair. Right? So you're better than me. I failed mine. But yeah, it's, it's a really tough, tough thing to get. Special mention to the instrument rating. After your private, which when you're going through private, you think it's the most difficult thing in the world, you go on to instrument rating, it's a lot more technical and it's, it's pretty tough, the, the transition to it. But instrument rating is very, very fun. Probably the, the most fun I've had uh, in flight training. What considerations did you think about in deciding to fly for Silver Airways? Yeah, so my considerations for Silver were quality of life. That's all I want, quality of life. What, what uh, I wanted to go somewhere that, that was going to allow me the opportunity to have the airline side to fly for an airline, but also continue to have my general aviation side and make my general aviation videos. And I have the perfect balance at Silver Airways. So that was my consideration. What works for me though, might not work for somebody else. At Silver Airways, I don't fly jets, I fly turboprops. I'm perfectly content with that. I'm perfectly content with doing shorter routes that we do at Silver Airways, but you might want to do long haul. You know, so that's a consideration that, that, uh, that, that you've got to take. You know, whether you want to deal with passengers or you want to deal with boxes cargo or passenger flying but yeah what works for one person may not work for the next so daryl what are your thoughts on being a career cfi i'm in mid 30s and thought of being away from home 20 days a month isn't very appealing but i would still like to work in aviation yep then it sounds like the cfi 
career is the one for you. You've got to be prepared for a lot of days of frustration because if, if you're anything like me, you really want the students to succeed. And if they're not studying the way that they should or they're not quite grasping something the way that you want them to, it can be frustrating. And you've got to learn to deal with that frustration and not show that frustration to students. So it, it's it's going to be a, a career filled with frustrating moments, but it's also going to be a career filled with elation and successes once you solo them i'm getting out i uh, wish me luck enjoy luck. yourself man i'm gonna yeah. be listening on the radio and get them through the license taking someone from zero up to the private pilot license with all like you doing all the training is one of the best feelings ever it, it, it is a really good career i'm with you on not wanting to be away from home for 20 days a month it's not appealing for me either big reason that i'm at silver quality of life i'm at home most nights so yeah I'm, I'm all for it i support you being a career cfi scott webster do you ever get behind the plane while flying with Silver? I've never felt like I've been behind the aircraft at Silver Airways. So my first type rating was on the Saab 340, and then my second type rating at Silver was the ATR. And the simulators at airlines and the airline uh, training is always very detailed. And when you get into the sim, it's failure after failure after failure after fire after failure after fire that you've got to deal with in the simulator. So it really conditions your brain to expect the worst and once the worst happens your training kicks in and it's an automatic response once you get through that simulator and you get out into the real world it's actually a relief because hopefully in the real world you don't have all these failures happening all the time those simulators are true to life i got out of both the saab sim and the atr sim and got into the real real world flying and it's it's exactly the same uh, it's, it's incredible, the technology that they've got. So no, I've never felt behind the plane. What qualities or characteristics could indicate that a person could be a good pilot? Good question. You've got to be English. Uh, that's going to get me cancelled. It was a joke. No, as somebody that uh, is good at multitasking is a good studier because there's people that go to flight training that just want to focus on the flying side and are not very good at the studying side and it just doesn't work. You have to give yourself a good foundation of knowledge to be able to take into the flight portions and if you don't study, you're not going to make it through. Uh, not being afraid of heights is a good one, although you can get over that. I was afraid of roller coasters before I did stalls for the first time and after I did stalls, I was like, roller coasters are a piece of p yeah, I mean, I think that's that's all I've got. If anyone has got anything to add about what makes a good pilot, let me know in the comments. Mitch Johnson, what is the best way to quickly determine a go or no go for weather? I think the best method of, of making a decision is to have a solid set of personal minimums for yourself. Let's say the weather is currently 1,500 foot clouds and three miles visibility, right? That's technically VFI, you can go. But if your personal minimums say that you don't want to go do a local flight unless the clouds are 2,500 feet and six miles visibility, that's a no-go decision. The current weather doesn't meet your personal minimums. Now, different people have different personal minimums. You may have minimums that I don't have because I've not flown in a particular set of conditions that you have. I might not be comfortable with something that you are comfortable with. So it's all based on what you're comfortable with and, and what experiences you have. So having those personal minimums and sticking to them, adhering to them is a really big thing. We all at some point are going to have a passenger on board that wants to get somewhere quickly or wants to get somewhere despite weather not being too good. As a human being, your natural reaction is to want to please that person and take that person and show them how cool flying is and get to them to, to where they want to go. But you have to remember, you have to block that side of your brain out and you have to go back and revert to safety. And that is where the, the personal minimums come in. So set yourself personal minimums, stick with your personal minimums and only do stuff that you're comfortable with. Solar rings, do you fly on any simulators? Oh, I used to fly simulators or, or have simulators on my computer and they are so good for helping with flight training. Students that I've had in flight training that have flown simulators before starting training often flew better at first than people that didn't have any experience uh, on simulators. So it's really helpful. Like when I was going through my instrument rating, I would always do the flights with Josh and then go home and then redo the flights on my simulator, going through procedures like DME arcs and stuff and, and briefing approach plates while I fly and flying the approaches 
on the simulator and it really helped me with my with my flying so it, it they are really really good and these days those simulators are so realistic like the graphics on them are ridiculous we'll do one more question here to finish off mark costanzo will you be at sun and fun 2023 yes i will i'm hoping to get this podcast out before sun and fun but uh, but yeah, I'll be at Sun and Fun. I'll be doing meet and greets at the Flying Eyes booth. So I have the perfect solution for you. Squint no longer and wear sunglasses made by the best pilots. sunglasses for, for pilots. Hands down. But am I forgetting something? Nah. They're made to be very comfortable on your face to wear underneath headset. Hold on a second. Fun and fun month. Oh. Hello, Fly Nice. Lou Dix. Yeah, Sun and Fun. This month. Booth. Meet and greet. 11 a.m. Both days. Cool. I'll let them know. Alright boys and girls, I'm just here to let you know that I'm going to be at Sun and Fun this year in Lakeland, Florida. I'm going to be there on March 31st and April the 1st doing meet and greets at the Flying Eyes booth from 11am on both days. Stop in at the booth, come and say hello, we'll have a great time, and if you're going to be there, let me know in the comments. I'll see you there. See me walking around sun and fun stop me say hello always like to talk to people that enjoy my channel if you don't enjoy my channel then just jog on but for now that is going to be the end of episode one of the welcome to the sky podcast we've done it we got through it yeah hopefully some of the things that i've said about my flight training experiences have resonated with you thank you for watching on youtube if you did leave the video a like subscribe to ludic aviation if you haven't subscribed already if you're listening on spotify or wherever else i decide to put this podcast thank you for listening do whatever you need to do on there to show your love for the welcome to the sky podcast can't wait to bring you other episodes got some really cool stuff lined up and yeah that's it we did it thanks for joining me i'll see you next time